The prophecy of Isaiah opens in a courtroom, a site we're familiar with thanks to dramas that we've seen on TV and in the movies. But in Isaiah, this solemn scene pictures God calling the world to come, sit, and hear him present his case. And then with the most serious consequences at stake, God introduces a word of humor as he highlights the charges. Welcome to Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. I'm Steve Schwetz, and if all this sounds strange to you, well, pay close attention to Dr. McGee's introductory comments as we come to Isaiah chapter 1. As you hop aboard the Bible bus and find your seat and your place in God's Word, Greg's here with a few letters from our fellow passengers from the four corners of the earth. Yes, I, I love that. And, and actually, thanks for that introduction. I'm excited to hear what Dr. McGee has to teach today. I, yeah. I'm like, okay, would those guys stop talking? Let's get to Dr. McGee. <laughs> but seriously, we want to share this vision that, that Dr. McGee gave us of taking the whole word to the whole world. And, you know, people will ask me all the time, where is through the Bible heard? And I pretty much say almost anywhere on earth where they want to listen. Yep. And that's all thanks to our wonderful supporting, praying family. And here's some of the fruit. Yep, this first one is from what typically is not a very Christian country and oftentimes a hard place to be a Christian. That's Yemen. Mm. This is from the Arabic Bible bus. I wish to know more about your Bible and your faith. I found your program after seeing the Facebook page. The title drew my attention and then I clicked the link and started listening. I kept going back to the website to listen to one or two episodes a day. So this is a Yemenese mm. semi binge watching mm -hmm. guy. I cannot say I understand it all, but interest has grown in my heart. I would love to hear about your faith and I would love this new, strange and beautiful feeling that I get whenever I listen to continue. Is Christ real? Is he still living and can be sensed and talked to? Help me in this, please. Man, what a bunch wow. of softball pitches. <laughs> this guy is you. ready for conversion. At and the thought that just crossed my mind is, can you believe we get to be a part of this? I yeah. mean, really? Th th I mean, this is, what could be greater than to be part of offering the word of God and l answers about eternal life to a man like this? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Another corner of the earth. Let's go to Germany. I am a faithful listener and I've recently been betrayed by a close friend. I face financial ruin because of it. Until then, my life was easy. Now it seems almost too much. The thing that has kept me balanced is the way the Holy Spirit brings to mind all that I have learned through you. When I'm angry at the one who wronged me and think about revenge, God's word comes to mind. Hmm. When I am frustrated and want to lash out at others for my circumstances, God's word comes to mind. When I want to give up and give in, God's word comes to mind. Thank you for all you have taught me and are teaching me. Please pray for an end to this situation and that God redeems me. Hmm. Wow. And how encouraging how he keeps going back to God's word yes. comes to mind. Yes. That's key. Now, let's move over to Latin America. This listener says, I am a late starter because I have only just found you. I met a Christian for the first time not long ago, and I was directed to your programs. I had many questions and wondered if it was too late for me. I am old and have lived a hard life. I have done many things I regret. With each message, I learn more and am loving it. I am so grateful you take the time to explain the whole Bible. Please pray for me. I am only just beginning in my faith, but am grateful. I do not have to spend another day wondering what will happen to me when I die. Oh, my. So we've gone from Yemen to Germany to Latin America. And now let's finish our Four Corners of the Earth tour in eastern Nepal, a country mm. both you and I have been to. Yep. I am a housewife. I have time at home to listen to this program and consume heavenly food. Hmm. It has been important in shaping my and my family's life spiritually. Through this program, our lifestyle is being changed. It has been helping us to stand up for our faith. Our knowledge of the Bible has grown considerably. As I learned more, I began to plan a home group in my neighborhood where there are a few believers and the ones that do believe are so weak in their faith, they are not living a full Christian life. Hmm. Please pray God's word will bring revival in the lives of people and he alone will direct each one. Man, that wow. is so encouraging. So good. Yeah. Greg, we're out of time. <laughs> Why don't you go ahead and pray for our listeners around the world as well as for our study? Father, it feels like we've just been doing something holy, which is seeing inner lives of people that are hungering for you. And Lord, we just want to bow in thanksgiving and praise 
that you let us be a, a part, a small part of what you're doing in people's lives literally all across the earth. We pray you'd continue to honor the efforts we're making to get your whole word to the world. And now may we have that same kind of change in our lives as we open your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let's turn to Isaiah 1 as Dr. J. Vernon McGee takes us through the Bible. Now we have merely put out an introduction to the prophet and prophecy because we are now in that section through the remainder of the Old Testament. And we have one great book in the New Testament coming up. Now I'd like to speak today in particular of Isaiah and of him first of all in his personal life as a prophet. Now, most of the prophets, they moved in an orbit of obscurity and anonymity. They did not project their personalities into the prophecy they proclaimed. I think Jeremiah and Hosea are the exceptions to this, and we'll see that when we get to them. But Isaiah gives us very little of a historical character concerning himself. Now, there are a few scant references to his life and ministry, in the very first verse here, we're going to find out the times in which his lot was cast during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, and Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Now, in Isaiah 6, he records his personal call and commission that was given to him. And in one sense, logically, this chapter should come first but we're going to take it up as we have it. Now in Isaiah 36 and 39, we have a historical section which records a portion of the ministry of Isaiah during the crisis when the Assyrian host encompassed Jerusalem. Now there are a few personal sections, but Isaiah stands in the shadows as he points to another who is coming, the one who is the light of the world. Now, there are those that believe that Isaiah belonged to the royal family of David. And this certainly cannot be proven, but it is a tradition. And other scholars think that in Hebrews 11:37, when it speaks of some that were sawn asunder for their faith, that Isaiah is the one that is mentioned. Now, this may or may not be true. I do not know. But the liberal critic has sawn him asunder in forging the fake fabric of the Deutero-Isaiah hypothesis, and some even have gone so far as to fabricate a Trito-Isaiah, and there's not a scrap of documentary evidence beyond the skepticism of the destructive critic. They've cut Isaiah up like a railroad restaurant pie, but history presents only one Isaiah, not two, nor three, but just one, and a friend of mine who's made quite a study of the Dead Sea Scrolls tells me that Isaiah is the one that they have worked with probably more than any other part of the Dead Sea Scrolls, and there's a great section of Isaiah there. And at that time, there were no two Isaiahs. There was just one. So it's quite interesting that the Lord lets a little shepherd boy reach down in a clay pot in a cave way down in the Qumran area of the Dead Sea and take out a scroll and it confounds the critics. And I'm of the opinion we'll just let the Lord take care of them as we go along. And if you want to know how ridiculous it is, suppose a thousand years from today there are a group of archaeologists, they dig down over here in Kansas and they dig down in Washington and they dig down over in Europe. And they say, you know, there were three Eisenhowers. There was a General Eisenhower who led a great victory as a military leader in the European theater. And then there was another Eisenhower by the name of Dwight Eisenhower. He was president of the United States. He was elected in 1952 and 1956. And still there was another Eisenhower he was an invalid and a victim of a heart attack in a serious operation of Iletus. And somebody said, well, that's the most ridiculous thing that I've ever heard. <laughs> well, when I hear them talk about three Isaiahs, I feel the same way about it. Now, in Isaiah the prophecy, 
We have here a striking similarity to the entire Bible, and if you just make a comparison, it's rather remarkable. In the Bible, we have 66 books. In Isaiah, we have 66 chapters. In the Old Testament, we have 39 books. In the New Testament, we have 27 books. In Isaiah, the first 39 chapters, you have the government of God, and the emphasis is upon law. And the last 27 chapters, we have the grace of God, and there the salvation of God. There are 66 direct quotations from Isaiah in the New Testament. Some have found 85, and allusions to Isaiah in the New Testament. 20 of the 27 books of the New Testament quote from Isaiah. 12 books of the New Testament have direct quotations. Isaiah is woven into the New Testament as a brightly colored thread is woven into a beautiful pattern. Isaiah is discernible and conspicuous in the New Testament. Isaiah is chiseled into the rock of the New Testament with the power tool of the Holy Spirit. Isaiah is often used to enforce and enlarge upon those passages that speak of Christ. Now, the New Testament presents the Lord Jesus Christ as its theme, and by the same token, Isaiah presents the Lord Jesus Christ as his theme. He's been called the fifth evangelist, and the book of Isaiah has been called the fifth gospel. Christ's virgin birth, as we saw last time, his character, his life, his death, his resurrection, and his second coming are all presented in Isaiah in clearness and in definity. The apostle Peter wrote a word, I think that is especially applicable, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. And in the prophecy of Isaiah, you have that. You have the sufferings of Christ and you have the glory that will follow. And you remember the Lord Jesus, when he sat down yonder in the synagogue in Nazareth, where did he turn? He turned to Isaiah, the 61st chapter, and read there. And in this book, we're going to find a great deal of fulfilled prophecy. That is, when it was given, it was in the future. It has since been fulfilled. And prophecy is the mold into which history is poured. And we find that's going to be true in this book as we get into it. It's a thrilling book. It's a very wonderful book. Now, as we come here to the first section and the first 35 chapters here, have to do with judgment, the judgment of God. And we have here a historic interlude in chapters 36 through 39. And then we have salvation as the theme in chapters 40 to 66. Now you have in chapter 1 the solemn call to the universe to come into the courtroom of heaven to hear God's charge against the nation Israel. And if you listen to it, you will find out that it puts down the principles and the basis on which God judges nations. Now, God raises up nations and he puts them down. The kingdoms of this world today are Satan, but God overrules. And he has permitted great nations to come up and permitted Satan to use them. But when in God's program the time comes to move them off the stage, he moves them off. And as you come down the highway of history, you will find many along the way. Even his own people today are a testimony to the fact that God rules in the nations of the world and in the affairs of this world. Now we want to note here in the first chapter I want you to notice the way that he begins here. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Isaiah, 
Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Now, here in Judah, Uzziah, he became a leper because he intruded into the holy place, which even a king was not permitted to do. Uzziah was really a good king. His son Jotham, who followed him, was a good king. But Ahaz, the grandson of Uzziah and the son of Jotham, he's a bad one. He's a bad egg, let me tell you. And then Hezekiah was a good king, although he asked that his life be prolonged. It was, and I think probably that was a mistake because the bad things that took place not that he did any bad things, but the things he did certainly worked out not for the good of the kingdom, but actually for the undoing of the kingdom. This is the time. Now, God begins this prophecy in a most majestic manner. He says, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished and brought up children They've rebelled against me. Now, God is calling the world, if you please, to come into the courtroom and become a spectator and listen to him as he tries his people. And that's quite interesting because if you go back to the 32nd chapter of Deuteronomy, at verse 1, God at that time, when he was ready to put them in the land, he says, "'Give ear, O ye heavens,' And I will speak and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. And then God put down the conditions on which he was putting them in that land. And actually, he'd given them the land, but their occupancy of it depended upon their obedience to him. And now, after 500 years, he says, I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. They've rebelled against me. His charge is rebellion, and the condition on which they are to be in the land is obedience to God. And now they have disobeyed. They have rebelled against him, and according even to the Mosaic law, that when a man had a rebellious son, he was to be stoned to death. So the charge is a serious charge here that God brings against these people. Now, the reason that when the Lord gave that parable of the prodigal son, and it's probably one of the most familiar stories, and that of the Good Samaritan, of any that have ever been told. But the thing that made it such an exciting thing in Christ's day was the way that he handled it. He said that this son was not stoned to death. When he got home and asked for forgiveness, even before he finished his confession, Why, the father had thrown his arms around the boy, kissed him, and the father forgave him. And instead of stripes, why, he had for him a wonderful feast for him. And this boy here was received. Now, here again, God is saying, I have nourished and brought up children. They rebelled against me. Now, he goes on to make a very unusual statement. In fact, he breaks the tension of the courtroom by introducing a little humor. I hope you find humor in the Bible. If you do, it'll make it lots more interesting for you. And God has a sense of humor. I think that when we get in eternity and get past the time of sin on this earth, get past the program that God is working out and we're there in eternity, You know, I think we're sure going to have a good time. We're going to have many laughs, and it's going to be an hilarious situation, by the way. And it doesn't hurt as you go through today as Christians to have the right kind of humor. And God has put a lot of it in the Bible. At least I find a lot of it in the Bible. And I had a dear lady that was a member of my church. She shook a bony finger under my nose Every time I'd find humor in the Bible, she'd make a trip down front. And she'd say to me, you are being irreverent to find humor in the Bible. Well, I didn't know about being irreverent. I didn't think I was, but I sure found humor. And I only wish she could. She's since gone on to be with the Lord. 
And I do hope that she's had a couple of good laughs because she sure never had them down here. She never found humor in this life. In fact, I don't think she enjoyed the Christian life God wants us to. Now, will you notice? God says the ox knoweth his owner and the ass his master's crib, but Israel doth not know my people doth not consider. Now, the ox knows his owner and the ass, this little long-eared donkey, he knows his master's crib. Now, these two animals, friends, do not have a reputation of being very intelligent. In fact, their IQ is not very high. And you just don't find many of them around the ox. Well, you hear somebody say today the expression, he or she's dumb as an ox. Well, an ox must not be very smart. And then that little long-eared animal, you know, he has no reputation for being an intelligent creature. And you never saw one of them with a Ph.D. degree, I guess. Well, I'll have to back up. I have met a few that have a Ph.D. degree, by the way. But this little animal doesn't have very much of a reputation. But do you know that this little animal's got sense enough to know who feeds him? <laughs> the ox knows his owner. He knows who feeds him. And the little donkey knows his master's crib. When I was pastor in Texas, there was a vacant lot across from the church, and there was a very poor man. Never saw a man have as many patches on his overalls as he did. He'd bring a little donkey, a little burro, and he'd tether it in that vacant lot to eat the grass. And all the boys and girls, for that matter, in the neighborhood would go over and ride the little animal, including the preacher, by the way. I'd go over there and get on his back. To, he paid no attention to any of us. But late in the afternoon, when the owner came for him, that old man come tottering along. That little donkey would prick up those long ears, and my, he knew his owner. He knew who was going to feed him that night. But you know there are a lot of people today, they don't know God feeds them. They do not recognize him at all. It's like the story that I've told you about the little boy that was going next door for his first trip away from home on his own, and he just couldn't wait to get over there. His mother had to hold him back, but at 5 o'clock she dressed him, and he made a break for it. He went over there, and everything was new. And they sat down at the table, and these people where he visited, they were not Christians, but his home was a Christian home. He was accustomed to bowing his head, and somebody had returned thanks, so he just bowed his head as a matter of habit, but he noticed things were being passed and he didn't want to miss a thing. So he opened up his eyes and looked and he didn't have any inhibition. So finally he said, he says, don't you thank God here for your food? And they were a little embarrassed and they said, no, we don't. He thought a minute. He said, you're just like my dog. You just start in. There are a lot of people like that today. Oh, there are multitudes of people just living like an animal. And my friend, God said that of his people. He says, you know, the ox knows his owner. The ass is master's crib. But my people, they do not know. And today we hear about man as descended from an animal. My friend, <laughs> who said he has? He acts like one today. In fact, animals are smarter. Maybe instead of we descended from an animal, maybe an animal descended from us and has evolved into something better than we are. Oh, my friend, man today drops pretty low. I think this was quite a sharp thing that the Lord said as he opens up court. He's called the whole world in. And he says now, this is my general chart. Now, next time, he's going to make it specific. And when he makes it specific, we are going to see that God is carrying out the great principles by which he judges nations and the way nations go down. And we're going to see that next time, that always, first, there's spiritual apostasy, there is moral awfulness, second, and then there is political anarchy and Frankly, we're going to see the problems not in Washington. It's closer home than that. May God richly bless you, my beloved. All of that will be revealed next time. 
to prepare, read Isaiah 1, verses 4 through 18. And to get the chart of the kings of Israel and Judah that Dr. McGee mentioned, you can download our digital book, Briefing the Bible, over at ttb.org or call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. I'm Steve Schwetz, grateful for your company on the Bible bus and your partnership in taking God's whole word to the whole world. Jesus made it home. Oh, to be my home. Sin had left a crimson stain. Be washed white as snow. Through the Bible exists to take God's whole word to the whole world. And we invite you to stand with us with your faithful prayer and financial support. Where will God's word go today?